Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we operate the pizza oven, and we have full pizza uh, service indoors and out. Um, we do have charcuterie plates and things like that every day for something to nibble on, but um, you know, and typically we'll either have you know an outdoor crew, an indoor crew, and uh, both Mondays, you know, midweek, I just have enough for the indoor crew, and uh, we will we'll occasionally have people out here. They want it specifically, wine club members and all that will set up out here. First winery, the original winery, um, this is the Redwood Cellar, was built in 1861 by, oddly enough, a guy named Charles Krug. And then he, uh, it, it burned down in 1872. It was a beautiful wood structure at the time. Rebuilt using stone the next time around. Uh, burned down again in the 1890s. Uh, after he had passed and rebuilt again and so this was all completed and then it was sold to the banker of Charles Krug and his and his wife Caroline Vale um, and it kind of became a ghost winery for about 30 years during prohibition so there was still wine produced but but uh, there was a really neat part to this whole thing Charles Krug's bride uh, Carolina Bale um, they actually received this property as a dowry when he married her. Um, and so her father granted this 500 acre uh, dowry of, of which the land was built. So, but when she, and she loved her husband and when he, he was a scholar, he was a brilliant, a brilliant man. He was really considered a leader in the you know, California period. Um, and he was just so beloved when he passed her, his wife, Put in the covenant of the land that any wine ever produced on this property had to bear Charles Krug's name. Hmm. See, it looks like the those are cinder blocks at the top of the brick. The 1870s cinder block was considered a, kind of a luxury building item. It was hmm. kind of new, and it, it was like the really rich wineries were built out of cinder block. So they actually built it out of stone, and then they cemented over it and stenciled on the, the, the cinder block look. The Blue Note Jazz Club, so it's a little small theater, 120 people upstairs, Jam Cellars is about 300 people. Beautiful building, it's really nice. It's a great building, but yeah. they couldn't have concerts. So oh, okay. our CEO, Judd Wallenbrock, is good friends with the, the guy that runs the Blue Note, Ken Tesler. And, they started talking about, well, let's yeah. look at shows here. So all of a sudden, they came up with this brainchild of, of socially distant, safe, and it's still to this day, it's like two tops spread 10 feet apart, outdoor concerts, and and 300 people per show. And it's just, and they're great jazz shows. We've had everybody from Kenny G bring in a barbecue truck. Post-COVID, you know, when things relax a little bit more, it'll go from holding 300 people in, on tables and chairs to up to about 600 people per show. Six to 700, okay. I think is the maximum they could get if they do regular theater style. It's called Nimbash. And Nimbash is the, the art, Nimbus Arts, and the, it's an organization that supports local artists. And they're absolutely beloved beloved organization in this valley and uh, so they always throw they every year this event called Nimbash uh, is it's a Burning Man like event but the, it took over the whole carriage house the lawn you'll see that um, you know enough where we had all this heavy equipment just to bring in stuff it's the carriage house this is actually it was a a gift from Charles Krug to his wife, who loved horses, and they, um, so it, it, he built this in 1881, and so this is where they kept all the horses, uh, their carriages, all the, the tack and everything was upstairs. This was actually remodeled about 10, 12 years ago, and because it's a national historic building, uh, it, we had to have an archaeological architect from the state on site to ensure that you can't touch the outside at all. So you can, and we had to earthquake retrofit it. 
which is the which was behind because it was a freestanding masonry building. Same thing with that. So everything had to be retrofit. Designed for you know, horses and carriages, and, but yeah. So this was all actually old wood beams, and you know this was just where we stored dry goods for you know decades. One of, one of our basic things with the winery is that uh, we're one of our basic tenets is that we want to be the cultural hub of Napa Valley. So we're going to do so through uh, through support of the arts in lots of manners, whether it's a, you know, a group like Nimbus or our, our own thing. We had comedy, so we're supporting the comedic arts. We're home of the uh, Napa Valley Film Festival. The upstairs is the, one of the main venues. Uh, we have a lot of events out here on the lawn. This is called the Great Lawn. And so we have um, and it's, it's approximately, I think it's about eight or nine acres. Um, and we're, because we're the oldest winery in Napa, we're also grandfathered in and we can still, we're still one of the few wineries that can hold weddings. We can hold large events or small events. And it's, you know, we're just kind of blessed with that. And we, we predate Napa <laughs> yeah, or any of those guidelines or rules. So, so this is, you know, there was a stage they, they built back in the late 40s, early 50s. They used to just have, you know, town meetings here. And this was, this was the hub of Napa Valley at that time. St. Helena is where everything happened. So, so, so we've had everything. So this year, I mean, we had this. This was about eight, 900 people that were part of this event. And there was tents all over the place. I mean, this was an amazing set up. But for Festival Napa Valley, which is an, a 10-day festival of, of it's primarily dance, symphonic arts, uh, opera, um, they had to build a huge 100-foot stage on the south end of the property and seated about eight, 900 people um, here. Again, all <laughs> socially distanced, and, and, but it was like the perfect venue for these outdoor events. We also do weddings here, so we're one of, again, one of the only winers to do weddings in Napa Valley, so this is typically where our weddings are held. In the 1970s, the county of Napa started tightening the clamp down on all of these events. There was, I mean, this valley, 70s into the 80s, 30, 40 wineries were open to the public here. There's over 500 now, and everybody wants events and all that, so there's, as the, you know, the length of time you've been doing them, there was a certain cutoff. It's like, okay, from this point forward, you can only do 20 events. So we had all these hills burned. We had all of the hills, uh, the Napa River is on the east end of our property. All the trees along that burned. The field to the north of us burned. And then all the ridge line up there you can go back about six, seven miles, everything's burned uh, over the top there. So we've had our share of not fun times. So it didn't hurt the structures. So what about your, your vines? So grapes, uh, it's still a work in progress. We're, you know, we got a lot of the white wines uh, came off before the fires hit. Uh, a large number of the 2020 reds probably won't make, won't make the final cut. So we may not have much of vintage at all. Yeah, so out here we got we have Merlot, Petit Verdot, Sinfandel out there. Um, and let's see, we're still we're still grapes on the vines. If they're ready to make wine, we're ready to squish them. So anybody uh, in this valley picks at night. So okay, usually yeah. picking starts at 10 o'clock. All the grapes have to be to the winery, typically by 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning, because you don't want grapes sitting out in the sun. Okay. They'll just start fermenting, and the sugars will spike. And it's it's so you, they try to get everything done at night. This is a Native American uh, belief that um, when there's heavy acorn fall, mm -hmm. as there is this year, that there's is always is followed by a, a very wet winter. Yeah, we're at less than I think it was like 27 percent of rainfall this year, which is brutal. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're well watered here, but 
Yeah, in the mornings after a couple days, you know, things will be coated. So you don't do any dry farming here. Everything has to be. Early. So not here. I think there's a couple. Of our, we, we own nine vineyards, um, of which I think two of them may be dry farm, but not not all of them. So um, we still need to control that. Yeah, this is uh, all well here. So we have, um, all of our vineyards are on well. Part of this whole thing has been this voluntary reduction because they do monitor well usage as well, and they do monitor. Um, water usage, and we've, they've been asked, they've been asking all of the production companies that use a lot of water to cut back by 30 percent, which we've done pretty well. Just cut back on what you, you know, instead of a, an hour drip, you do them for 45 minutes. So, kind of, this is one of those interesting facts about the wine business that, even though, I mean, it, some of our crop is that is planned, some of it is um, a little lighter this year, but the lighter the crop, the smaller the berries. The, the higher the quality of the grape typically and that's that is one of the, the inverse the yeah. good thing about a drought yeah. and small crop is having yeah. really really exceptional quality you know people really study vintages and know that okay 15 was a really lean vintage but yeah. some of the 15s and I was over in Sonoma County at the time and um, the, the Pinot crop was really light it was wet and foggy and yeah. but the grapes that came through beautiful the 15s were some of the best pinots I had ever had. So, you know, versus big fat grapes yeah. and heavy crop, and it's like they, they can kind of be over, you know, overwatered or the sugar's diluted a little bit. Stacy, our winemaker, makes all the calls. She's out in the vineyards all the time, especially this time of year. And so she has a lot of experience. It looked like she's done this for what? 35 years yeah, she's more? Been, yeah, she's been around. You know, consistent vineyards, consistent style of winemaking. You know, that is the nice thing. We own all our own land. We're still farmers. It's still family owned by the Mandavis. Um, we're now in the fifth generation, so they still live here. Family owned estate wineries are getting fewer and fewer. It's like you would just be amazed driving up and down 29 or mm -hmm. Silverado Trail. How many of those wineries are no longer in the families that started. They, they're all corporate owned. There hasn't been a Mandavi affiliated with Robert Mandavi Winery since 2006. Uh, when Cesare and Rosa Mandavi, they, they're Ellis Island immigrants that came uh, from across the United States to somewhere in Minnesota. He was a grocer, they had a, a boarding house, they had a bar, but he was getting his fruit from California. So he really wanted to come to California to see where his fruit came from and eventually he went to Lodi came and said this is a beautiful place. So sold what they had in Minnesota, came out here and then he really got into the grape side of things. Still ship you know fruit to the grocery store back you know but now he was like in love with California. So his friend Ernest Gallo said Oh, if you really want to get into wine, he's like Napa is a is the place to be now. So, so they came up here. Cesare and Rosa came to Saint Helena area. Found that loved this area. Um, they started a small little brand called Sunny Saint Helena. But then this property became available. So uh, the bank that owned it uh, sold it to them, 150 acres for seventy-five thousand dollars. So they did okay on the real yeah. estate. Yeah, I think so. But they. Um, but it's still uh, in the family uh, trust, and so they still farm it. So, so this was originally Cesare and Rose's house, and then th their sons Peter and Robert and Cesare together they ran this winery uh, until Cesare passed in 1959. Rosa still was the matriarch. I, somebody says she's the first woman president of a major winery, um, and then. She ran it with her sons, Robert and Peter, until the two of them had a falling out in the 60s. And Robert essentially moved down to his part of the world in Napa. Peter retained this uh, Charles Krug property and all the land that came with us. And they went two different routes. We were the first winery to import French oak barrels. Uh, Peter Mandavi created cold maceration, which at the time mm. was like, that's insane. You don't. You, have to let things heat up and extract flavor. 
slow it down, extract more, richer flavors. That was Peter Mondavi. Um, there was a whole bunch of things that Peter was really innovative about. And um, so it was just, he eventually acquired nine different vineyards um, in addition to some land out in the valley uh, that does the CK Mondavi brand. And um, so then we moved fast forward. He passed uh, about eight years ago and his two sons, Peter Jr. and Mark Mondavi. Peter Jr. lived there, Mark lived over there, Peter Sr. lived here. Until he passed. So it's like, this has always been a family house. So now this house is, it's, I always say it's the house that 1974 forgot, because cool old, it just it looks authentic as can be, but this is where the families have meetings and board of directors meetings are held in there. So this is a room that, this is our library room. The, the, the vintage select library. So every vintage that we've had since 1944 is, most of them are stored in that room right there. And so we have three remaining bottles of the first vintage of Mandavi's in 1944 there, but there's a lot of historic wines in there. And it's a great age-worthy style. So this is all vintage select, so it's the red stripe indicates that that's always our best Cabernet. This is typically where all of our old reserve, or our reserve wines are made. Um, right now, all of these barrels are empty, awaiting uh, crush and proper timing so so as soon as they're as soon as that those wines are ready for barrel uh, this turns back into a into a barrel room so the big red barrel so I was like this is kind of the the old school new school uh, traditional school uh, kind of all comes together in one so big red that uh, back from the early 40s until I think it was the early 70s, um, a lot of wine was made in these redwood barrels. We had 171 of these barrels and it was completely, um, uh, they stopped using them. But they, so the architect that eventually did the rebuild of this building, um, he's renowned for using product, or recycling things or upcycling things. So he, we built a, he built a small mill out in the parking lot and then moved uh, all of the wood in this room, all recycled redwood. The thing about redwood, it was the most plentiful wood available yeah. in California, so most of the winemakers used redwood. Uh, oak wasn't really introduced. It was a harder wood, harder to work with, but, but you know, Robert and Peter Mondavi brought over the front, first French oak barrels here, and then that was the, the end of redwood barrel time. But redwood's a neutral wood, so it doesn't impart any flavor. It's also easy, it doesn't rot. It's, it's just a, it's a really special wood to, to work with, so. So the eggs are primarily used for Sauv Blanc and Chardonnay. The cement adds a, an acidity. I mean, there's an acidity element to cement eggs that really pops the acidity. So that's why we do our, you know, the lighter wines. I know some wineries do their Pinot in it, but. Right now, this is just shard, shard and uh, top lawn for reserve wines. Yeah, this was another innovation of Peter as well. These old glass tubes. So coming out of World War II, there was a huge shortage of steel, especially uh, uh, stainless steel or galvanized steel. So uh, they came up with he came up with this glass tubing. This is all the tempered glass tubing. There was thousands and thousands of feet of this that all went across the railroad tracks into the production. The hoses were put here, and they, these were easy to, easier to clean. They didn't have the, you know, any of the, the issues that steel pipes did.
we get people that are here all the time at wanting crude champagne. So this came out, this was another employee uh, suggestion of we need to have bubbles. And so we, we actually contracted with a company that makes sparkling wine to our specifications. And so we only sell it here in the tasting room. And it's, it's, it's a delicious, this is our Blanc de Blanc. But we named it after Carolina Bale, Charles Cruz's bride. You know, to kind of honor her as part of the history of this place. So five, these five wines, the Napa, we call them the Napa tier wines. These are the wines you'll be able to find in your grocery store, your local wine shops, all of them. There is two other wines. It's our Generations and the Vintage Selection. Those two wines are the ones that we um, only sell to white linen tablecloth restaurants. So you only see those uh, scattered around the U.S. But all the rest of these are all available just here through our wine club, uh, through the tasting room. Three different selections that they have. They'll, have. they'll be able to do an estate tasting, which is what we're doing. So a selection of five wines, usually we add a bonus wine at the end. Um, and we just tell, you know, stay, we sit and do a little walking or talking history of the place. Then um, the, the, we do a reserve tasting, you know, break out some of the older wines. And, and, uh, and then we, we do that only a couple, three days a week. And then we do a uh, walking estate tour and tasting. So we'll do the tour that we did. Mm -hmm. And so we go out, we go out the vineyards and private grapes and... So it's about an hour and a half, and then and then out in the, then the actually outside the cabana tastings are a whole different thing. So wine club members uh, they are able to essentially rent a cabana for two hours um, for one hundred and fifty dollars, and usually it, it, we credit whatever the sales are. So if they buy one hundred and fifty, there's no fees. Uh, and then outside people, we can hold, hold groups up to 12 people out in the, we have a double wide cabana. Yeah. And they rent that for $400, and the same thing, a combination of food and wine, it, you know, it's credited back and so We're a dog friendly winery, or we're a kid friendly winery, and you know, outdoors is a good spot for all that. And, but it's just, it's a great, you know, there's so many different spaces. The estate tasting, your most popular? I mean, yes. that's what most people come in and do, the estate tasting. Yeah. yeah, we have a couple other, like, specialty things. We have a thing called the Nosh Tasting North of St. Helena. <laughs> so it's a partner a partnership with Behringer across the street, Crew, Charles Crew, and then uh, Marion. Oh, look at the one. Marion. Marion, uh, up the street. And so the, four, the three of us all that have different elements to us. So Behringer... Uh, let's we'll start at Charles Cruz, go over to Behringer for lunch, and finish over at Mary's.